episode 369 of the Cyber Law Podcast, brought to you by Steptoe and Johnson. We're lawyers talking technology, security, privacy, and government. And the views we're about to express here do not reflect those of our firms, our clients, our families, our friends, or our pets. Uh, joining me for the news roundup today, Matthew Hyman, Senior Fellow and Director of Planning at the National Security Institute at George Mason, Paul Rosenzweig, founder of Red Branch Consulting, Dave Itell, who's an information security specialist uh, who founded the Itell Foundation with the proceeds of his last startup and who just launched another called uh, Cordyceps. Dave, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us all. Okay. And I'm Stuart Baker, formerly with NSA and DHS and the host of today's program. I We all have to start because once again, there's another massive ransomware, this one in some ways bigger than the, any of the past ones. Paul, do you want to give us a breakdown of what has happened with the Kaseya ransomware attack? Sure. I mean, I'll give you the non-technical version and I'll let Dave give you the technical version. Uh, but the bottom line here is simple, is a managed service provider that provides backup IT services to a whole host of companies. And the ransomware uh, criminals, Ray Evil, apparently, uh, has claimed credit for it, got inside their update, their supply chain update system and used the fact that they were a privileged service provider to who was able to push updates of their own software to all of their customers without the customer's intervention or consent, they, they got inside the supply chain and used that upware, update process to push their own ransomware malware. And they are, it's unclear how many systems they've, they've encrypted. Kaseya says it's you know, on the order of a couple thousand different clients who are affected. They're claiming a million different, com million plus computers. They've asked for uh, $45,000 per system or a bulk discount rate of 70 million in Bitcoin to give the public decryptor key back to the world. There, as I said, David can tell you more about technically what vulnerabilities were exploited than I can possibly explain. But what it, it seems clear to me is that A, the business model works and it will continue to be used by ransomware criminals until we find some way to break the business model. We can talk about the policy pieces of that later. B, that this is going to be a big test for Mr. Biden, who will need to figure out a way to impress upon Vladimir Putin that hosting these kinds of bad guys on your territory and not at least participating partially in an effort to turn them down is unacceptable public. Yeah, that's. I want to get to that, but first I want to give Dave a chance to talk about how this was pulled off. It's clearly, in principle, it's a kind of supply chain attack, although it's a little uncertain about whether the this is an attack on suppliers of, so that Kaseya's software can be compromised, or whether it's just a compromise of Kaseya so that its customers can be compromised. I'm not sure there's a big difference between those two, although for a while Twitter was all hung up on which it was. Dave, does it matter which it is? It's basically, it's an upstream attack and, and flowing downstream to a whole bunch of people who are relying on Kaseya, and maybe in the middle, they're relying on a MSP who was relying on Kaseya. I would say it does matter at a certain level, I think, and it's been a very fuzzy few days. So it's been hard to get the straight dope on what really happened. My understanding currently is that there was a vulnerability in Kaseya's product. And that vulnerability allowed you to take over the Kaseya server and then go from there into all of the workstations that server manages. And to see the impact of that, you have to understand that Kaseya's market is selling to the managed security providers themselves. So they'll say they have 40,000 customers, but each of those customers has 40,000 customers mm -hmm. or some number of small clients that they're managing. And so the impact is magnified pretty extensively, but Kaseya itself has not been said to be compromised, which means they can deliver patches and information and other things without having a, an inability to, ver to sort of have a secure network, which is an, so there is an important difference 
But if you're the dental office that was being managed by some provider that you hire locally, and now all of your systems are locked up, none of this matters to you. Right. So like that is the distinction without a difference in that sense. I would say there's been a lot of uh, very heated discussion about whether or not the vulnerability was an O-Day or if it was already known to Kaseya. Right. There's been a lot of analysis of the attack surface. Kaseya appears to be, and I can't say this definitively, but appears to be built on some very old, like we're talking two decades old technology that is getting end of life in a few years. And the techniques used to exploit the vulnerability have reportedly been things like SQL injection, which is one of those signs that your software is not up to scratch, right? Like if I was a lawyer, I'd start reaching toward terms like gross negligence would be the term I'd be reaching towards. Yeah. And, and it also feels like maybe they're basically end of lifing their own product. They're, they're milking uh, our stream of revenue, knowing that it's going to die. And rather than further investing in a stream of revenue that's likely to die, they're just kind of limping along without making a lot of changes. Well, they wanted to IPO this year, oh. right? So I think that okay. was the plan. And if you go back to his, the CEO's initial discussion, and the CEO delivered a very interesting uh, video this morning talking about the limits of the compromise. He's like only 50 to 60 of our customers were compromised. And of course, by that, he means 50 or 60 large MSPs were compromised. Right, which have thousands of- Which have thousands of customers. So that's where sort of the impact comes from. And I would say that, you know, this is only one of many products that they sell. And he was very key, like clear on that. but. If the, the standard of your software development practice is such that you have very basic vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure software would allow it to be taken over, you have to look at the other products that they sell and assume similar issues exist. And as a customer, what you should have done is had access to some level of transparency to penetration testing and other security documentation, right? So that's what you want, but apparently no one had that. Where it's a very interesting story. Obviously, he, he gave the Biden administration kudos in their level of response, yeah. which is a new thing. Like companies didn't used to do that. So right. let's at least. And he, he called uh, DHS as well as the FBI. So uh, CISA yes. was happy. Yes. Everyone got their call out. And he's like, but I think what he was a little bit dissembling on was the idea that this was an extremely sophisticated attack that, of course, everyone is due to get attacked like this. And that's just not the case. When your software is this weak, you are the slowest person running from them. And that is, in some sense, your fault. And I think what we're going to see is a lot of lawsuits about a lot of this stuff. And right now we're seeing a PR effort that was well done. He was both looking into the camera and away from the camera. It was like very crafted, but I don't think it was necessarily the case. Now, these people live in Miami, so I may run into them at the local Whole Foods. They may run into they you may, now. <laughs> they might run into me. But nonetheless, I think there's a lot of interesting sort of geopolitical strategy around this that you were hinting at, which is that the current administration has already been pushing on the Russians very strongly for this exact type of issue. And now it's giant log on the fire. Right. So uh, uh, what about this, Paul? Uh, uh, we The president just announced, and so did Putin, that there's some new cooperative arrangement between the U.S. and Russia over cyber uh, uh, attacks. Is that going to change the way these uh, this particular attack unfolds? Do you think that there is a realistic possibility that Putin will do something about Revil? Do you think there's a realistic possibility that the second coming will happen uh, this week, it, Stuart? Well, low probability, I, I, I'm afraid. I, Putin's response is higher than that, but I don't think that the Biden administration has yet to find the right levers to move him. Uh, he has no real incentive at this point. Public shaming has never seemed to move him. And we have yet to find a deterrence model that works against him or against Ravel direct. So unless and until President Biden is willing to sort of unleash more aggressive American counter responses of some sort that could take a range from diplomatic to economic to cyber to information operations. So I'm not picking the particular response. Nothing's going to happen. I think 
It is in Biden's interest to make it seem as though he's being responsive with a task force and a working group. And it's in Putin's interest right now to make him seem as though he's going to be responsive. But I would be very confident that in six months from now, there isn't going to be a single evil person who has been brought to justice in any way, manner, shape or form, whether that's economically sanctioned, criminally charged, or hit by the special ops forces of the U.S. So, so calm, <laughs> you know, not going to happen. So doesn't that mean that in doesn't that mean that in six months the president of the United States is look going to look weak and ineffectual and embarrassed on the world stage, or at least maybe di diplomatically here I, in I the U.S. I think so. He's pl but on the other hand, and to be fair to him, he's playing a bust hand which is to say we don't have a lot of really good levers available right now. And the only ones we have that are, would be effective are ones that in real, realistic world we can't use, like droning the re reveal guys. <laughs> Just not going to happen. So wait, wait, why can't we do that? Oh, we don't know where they are. Well, that, that's a good start. start. I need a tar I need to. I mean, if it were me, if it were me, I would be targeting their money. I would find all of Reveal's Bitcoin wallets and I'd destroy those servers. And that would be fun. Yeah. And just go after their profit. Make it change the economic incentive. That's my first cut at a policy. Well, I, I would also I point out like this is not a US only problem. No. Right? They operate against an international like group, right? That the many European companies were hit, other other well, it looked countries like the Swedes hit. got hit pretty hard. So and I, I just I think one thing we sort of put this on President Biden, but it really is about building an international alliance that is pressuring Russia from this. And it's not just Russia, obviously, but Russia is the number one category A evil on this issue. And I actually wonder if even if we had the right leverage, is this something Putin could shut down if he really wanted to? That Everyone says he can. I don't know that he can. That, that one I'm going to disagree with you on. I mean, nothing, I mean, in the short run, maybe not. I mean, he, can he shut it down tomorrow? Maybe not. But he runs a police frickin' state. In the end, if he wanted to do this, I, I, another lever I want to do is I want to find his secret, Putin's secret Swiss bank account and ransomware that back to him. Isn't that what happened with the Panama Papers? Matthew. Yeah, I'm with Paul. One of the benefits of running a... a tyrannical police state is you are not hobbled by things like law regulation courts bureaucracy and so the idea that he can't do anything about this or gee i can't find them i don't know where they are i mean when half of these folks are subcontracted to russian military units it's kind of i understand you don't want to crack the whip on essentially in many cases what are subcontractors when they're your guys he just has no interest in doing it that's why it doesn't happen yeah. And he has no incentive to. And we haven't done the things that, you know, whether it's droning things, whether it's taking decoupling Russia completely from the SWIFT system. Those are all things that have been talked about in years past that have never been done. And it doesn't help the Biden administration. If you open the papers today and you read about this latest event and then you see other parts of the Biden administration saying we're really going to scale back the use of economic sanctions which is, was the number one uh, tool that the Trump administration would pull out of the toolbox whenever something was going on in the world it didn't like. And so it, it sort of leaves you wondering, okay, so if you're not going to use economic sanctions and you're counting on the good faith of Putin and his, uh, the head of the FSB that they're going to cooperate with you, and the very allies we mentioned, uh, European nations that are affected by the but they're the ones that are often the least willing to do anything adverse to Russia. It, it just makes you wonder, well, where is the stick going to come from? Because it's hard to see anywhere. I, I would posit, though, that sanctions have had limited further effect. Like once you've sanctioned at a certain level, I mean, how many more? So I think that may be why they're saying they're going to pull back on it. And, and that's just a guess. Right. But that's just saying, oh, well, that didn't work. So we're not going to do more of it. And that's probably right, that there, uh, there's a point of diminishing returns and we've long ago passed it. Last question on this. My impression is that if people are listening to this and they want to know what they should do to protect themselves against an attack like this, I think that the short answer is you can't. You're, you have to rely on the people who are providing your security services. You're, 
might be an MSP. And they are, you have to count on them not only to do a good job, but also to choose their software wisely, which may not be the case. I think a lot of legal firms who listen to this podcast, even the big ones, use this kind of MSP and may have been hit. And can you imagine the nightmare of having your client's sensitive documents leaked via a ransomware attack? I think the time where a large law firm or a medium-sized law firm even could afford to have an MSP that was not an extreme top tier has long passed. So the, the so, good news here, though, is that I'm not sure they had time to do the classic big doxing attack that you see as the second wave in uh, ransomware because they basically had to go out and, and encrypt everybody all at once. And I don't know that they got to, to lounge around the system looking for the most damaging emails to collect. Let's assume that in the next attack, they will have learned that lesson and they'll have <laughs> automated that part, right? So yeah. we shouldn't assume that they're going to get worse or stay the same. Let's nope. assume they're going to get better. Fair enough. And, and that means you got to prepare. Okay, let's let's shift, to, uh, since this seems to be an all-Florida program so far, uh, let's go to Governor DeSantis. Paul Light, uh, federal judge, Clinton appointee, uh, has enjoined Florida law trying to bring to heal the big social media platforms uh, in respect of their content moderation. And he basically said, uh, I, it's all just bad. I'm going to enjoin it all. Uh, can you give us a little bit more detail about what he said? <laughs> no, I mean, that's basically what he said. He kind of laughed at them. There are, I thought there were a couple of interesting things. First off, as you said, this was a, a suit for an injunctive action to enjoin the enforcement of Florida's anti-content moderation law, which was premised on the idea that big, big content moderation platforms were biased against conservative viewpoints and and was designed to force them to carry conservative content. Let's leave aside completely uh, whether or not the factual premise is correct, because there's I know you think that it's true, Stuart, because you personally have been sent. Uh, but I don't think it's because you're conservative. I just think it's because you're a troll and ir irris irrespective. But let's leave that aside. The premise was avowedly content specific. And so on that basis, trying to impose upon the big providers, Facebook, Google, whatever, a, 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 a kind of anti-neutrality principle, a, a forced carriage. Uh, well, a forced, car a forced carriage of, imp uh, of, of candidates. They didn't say you, only the Republican candidates get the benefit of this. They said, if you're a candidate, you can't. Think. But it was only the Republican, but it, it was pretty clear that they've never that it's only the Republican candidates who are trafficking in, you know, anti, you know, falsity about the last okay, election. Okay, so now it's, it's so, basically, uh, I it, it, there's no evidence uh, of, of bias, but only Republican candidates are being shut down, and that's because of the moral well, no, failings there's of no, the there's no evidence. <laughs> there, there. Well, there's only the only if, if I assume that if a Democratic candidate had trafficked in anti-vaccination stuff that they'd have taken them off. It's just that none of them had, I mean, they, the content moderators had announced a neutral principle. Either way, there were lots of things wrong with the bill. Obviously the most humorous was the Disney theme park exemption, which which was just a carve out for our our favored major employer. But that doesn't play, that does so not play seemed, much of a role in the decision as far as I can see. No, it doesn't. The, the role in the decision was basically a rejection of what little there was of a of a legal theory behind this, which was kind of a common carrier theme, which is that the big providers are public are basically the equivalent of public utilities, and they must carry anybody who they can't they can be forced by the governments to carry stuff. Otherwise, of course, they are private sector actors who can't be who can't be induced in this way. It was kind of, it's, I, I know you feel as though there's more to be said for I this, do. Stuart, but I feel pretty confident in predicting that that viewpoint won't see but one vote maybe in the Supreme Court when it finally I'm, gets I'm, I'm guessing five, maybe six for upholding parts of this bill. How much would you like to wait? A uh, hundred dollars. How's that? I want to get in on this. Can you match another hundred dollars? In, insufficient I agree with Paul. because you're just trolling here, Stuart. <laughs> I, a thousand dollars. A thousand dollars. Okay. To which, 
I, I, all right, a thousand bucks. Your I will pick. I will, versus I will mine. pick a favorite charity. You pick a favorite charity. Yeah. Okay. Now we have to actually, since we're getting into real money, we actually have to define this, because I have no doubt that it's possible that some teeny portion of this. Okay. Okay. Will, now will he's getting survive. nervous. All right. No, but they will not force Facebook to carry Ron DeSantis's tweets. Uh, or yeah, I actually think the parts of this tweets. that are most likely to survive are the things that that say you have to be consistent in your application of your content moderation rules. You have to disclose what the what the standards are. Those things, which frankly, the judge, it's a thirty some page opinion, and it when you read it the second time, you say, God, there's almost nothing here. He gives all of this stuff the back of his hand. That clearly is the sort of thing that you could read into good faith as a, an understanding of what it means to have a good faith content moderation policy. And he doesn't even talk about that. It, uh, he does acknowledge that he can't preempt all of it using 230, that he's got to go to the First Amendment to knock down other parts of it. But I just don't see where the First Amendment says that uh, your content moderation decisions can be arbitrary and hidden from the world when what you are doing is cutting off the free expression rights of everybody else who's on your platform. And it may not be that... So, so your theory has to be... Well, I mean, first off, we, ha we, we start, I assume, with the agreement that... that that the First Amendment applies sure. to state to states is well, okay. So so when they say no law, you think that doesn't mean uh, no law. That means right. reasonable, no That's unreasonable absolutely. law. And you think that content that that moderate content moderation can be reasonably regulated? Yeah, be precisely because what we have is a situation where the First Amendment rights of Mark Zuckerberg are being weighed against the First Amendment of the, the free speech interests oh, of. No hundreds, if not They thousands. don't have a free speech right to speak on stop, his platform. Stop, is Paul, I understand they don't have a First Amendment right there, but they do have a free speech right. you just said a free speech. speech. Right. Yes. It, it, it is, to it, speak on his platform? His platform dominates discourse. They can get they they can set up getter no, no and go off to their little getter ghetto. So, so, but no, so I, you, I'm sorry. So you that, are that, so you are accepting the fact that they are essentially in your mind a public utility that can be forced hey, up to, to carry. a point at a minimum. The court is entitled to weigh the the free speech interests of everybody else in America against Mark Zuckerberg's claim that he can shut anybody down without any justification. I, yeah, of course. Well, I think if if we had to restate what you were saying, you you would say that the government has an interest in the free speech interests. Yeah. Of its populace, or, or that the because constitution, it's the government does. interests yeah. that weigh the, against it. The, the First Amendment c takes into account the fact that there are free speech interests on both sides of this debate. And a lot more, frankly, on the side of Ron DeSantis than on the side of Mark Zuckerberg. And I think what the judge said was that those in government interests would have to meet strict scrutiny. He did. He, well, he also has this kind of, again, the back of the hand, one and a half page discussion of whether it might meet intermediate scrutiny. And, and there's an argument that it's content neutral to say you just have to have procedures that you can explain. That's not restricting content. That's restricting procedure. I mean, I would definitely be on Paul's side. I, I don't want to be the most conservative person in the room, but like I would definitely say that the Supreme Court, if read by a non-lawyer, would say that these are making their own editorial choices and are allowed to do whatever they want. I mean, that's a weird position for me to have as a non-lawyer, but I mean, if you ever need to double down on your bet. All right. Uh, okay, so, so how about this, Stuart, to make it serious? You tell me offline which portions of the bill you think will survive in the Supreme okay. Court. And then we'll have another discussion. And I, if it's some minor piece that I, I don't care about, we won't bet, but I, they are not going to require- Well, Paul, did you notice the point where the judge also said that this does not just apply to Facebook and Google, it applies to large retailers- Yes, it applies to everybody. And there's a yeah. lot- It applies to libraries who manage content on their websites every day and i think the other yeah. portion is like the lieutenant governor did come out in the signing statement saying it was specifically anti-liberal which makes it very hard to say that they what they really want is content neutral disclosure of their things and i think that's one of the things the judge pointed at which reminded me a lot of like the trump sign trump discussions like when trump tweets out something about a position 
and then says the law is actually, oh, not about that. I right. Think the and Muslims... and, and, and it, it, there is an element of political incorrectness that he, like Trump, delights in uh, and that is bad for, that the lawyers all wince at for sure. Uh, so I'm going to have a lot of fun over the next couple of uh, hours trying to think of the most interesting legitimate charity that I can force Stuart to give a thousand. All right. Well, I I already know that the thousand dollars that you're going to have to pay is going to the Trump Defense Fund. Not a charity, (laughs) not an NGO. (laughs) Got to be a 501c. Equally hilarious. (laughs) All right. It's an incredible cliffhanger for the Cyberlaw podcast. Exactly. Tune in. both of you. Well, we're tuning in two exactly. years. That's the problem. Yes, they won't reach the court for another year at least, and then it'll take another year for them to argue it. I may have to file an amicus just to save my <laughs> thousand bucks. All right, That'd be awesome. Paul, the. National Security Agency ended up on the Tucker Carlson show with Tucker Carlson saying, uh, I have a whistleblower who says that NSA has been reading my mail and is going to be using it to try to get me tossed off the air. NSA issued a denial and now people are parsing the denial. Uh, uh, Do you think they actually agree on where the ambiguity lies or is this a question where they tucker carlson and nsa can't possibly both i can't parse what tucker carlson believes because he speaks so wildly so frequently Uh, i can parse the nsa statement because it's written and it's fixed and they say he's never been targeted and i believe that a hundred percent because i have every reason to think that the nsa has really pretty strong procedures against directly targeting American citizens and especially directly targeting people like... What I assume underlies all this is that Tucker talks to Ambassador Kislyak or other people in Russia who are legitimate targets of of NSA collection authority, who we want them to collect, and that he has been collaterally collected at one point or another and uh, presumably appropriately minimized. And, and that's the end of the real story. But somebody who has an axe to grind who noticed that it was a conversation that might have been Tucker asked for the unmasking, uh, probably for the purpose of leaking to Tucker, but with a facially neutral purpose. Tucker's name was appropriately unmasked at the request of some Trumpista who wanted to stir up trouble and then leak to, to so, Tucker, who's now on I think that's rant. unlikely. because, uh, But no, they're not targeting him. They're, uh, okay, and, and I'll withdraw the, it might be a Trump piece. It might just be a, a troll um, who just wants to create problems. But no, they're not targeting Tucker and they're not trying to get him off the air. But yes, when Tucker talks to Vladimir Putin on the phone, they collect I, that. I, that strikes me as the more plausible way to square the circle, that it's quite possible that Carlson does have a source who says, I saw an intercept that included your discussion, and I con- I conclude that it's being saved to, to embarrass you. That is all uh, possible, and it is also entirely possible that it was never reported, masked or unmasked, that it's just uh, a something that is has been collected and is sitting in the vaults of the National Security Agency where people can find it, not everybody, but a fair number of people could see it unmasked. And so it would be hard for NSA to say with absolute certainty, we have not a word spoken by Tucker Carlson anywhere in our vast digital library, and therefore they didn't say it. So it's possible that they're both right. I don't know, Dave, you work there. Does that sound like the most plausible way to... We both work there. <laughs> and I've already given my explanation. <laughs> my, my theory is like, what are the percentage chance that he just made it up one morning to fill airtime? I don't believe that. So, I, I don't see much of him, but I've been on his show once or twice. And I thought he was actually pretty smart and pretty thoughtful. I think he's very smart. I think he's very smart. I would say he's a genius. But I would say his veracity is not at the top level. So... I think there's a percentage chance he made it up. I think there's a percentage chance he said some stuff to some Russians that's sitting in a vault somewhere. And there's another percentage chance that Paul's right, that like someone unmasked that he was there. And I think the whole thing, I think it's the most interesting thing about the story is the NSA was forced to produce a comment the way it was, 
which I, I don't think has ever happened in the history of time. Yeah, but they'll, they'll but have to do it from now on. They know they cannot afford to just sit silent while, while Tucker Carlson says these things about them. Yeah, that's really a, a bigger story. I think Dave's right that, that the last 10 years have seen a remarkable transition in the public face of our security agencies. The IC on the record, and they have a Twitter account, and now they're actually denying specific allegations of problems. It's just... Quickly. You know, and quickly, yes. Uh, amazingly nimble for a U.S. government agency. All yes. right. I would say that's it. So let's move to Maine, as far as we can get from Florida. It's passed one of the most sweeping facial recognition bans so far. Paul, I... This does, I'm not wild about this law, but it, it lives up to its billing as being a very aggressive regulation of state use of facial recognition. I think that's right. It's a, it's, you know, you and I have always said, Stuart, all technology is neutral. It's just put to either good or bad uses. And this is one of those instances in which the fear of misuse exceeded the hoped for anticipated positive use, I think it probably swings far, uh, too far in, in the privacy direction. This was an ACLU victory. In fact, they may be the group that I, I mean, yeah, uh, that, just to now, deal. Now we know um, they're going to yeah, file so, an amicus brief in this case, <laughs> just, just to get the thousand bucks from me. So, so basically the law prohibits the government use of facial recognition, except in a few really specific outline situations. The most broad exception that I can see is if the police actually have probable cause to believe that an unidentified p person in a particular image committed a serious crime or is about to commit a fraud or a crime, they can, add, they can use facial recognition technology. Other than that, the police are, uh, the main state police are SOL and they won't have access to it. The, I gather they can still ask like the FBI to do it. So, so I'm not sure how much of a real change this will be, though we all know that every procedural barrier you put in is a real restrictor in a lot of ways. And it's really like only the second. I think Washington has a law, but the Washington law had a bigger carve out for the police. So, so this is probably uh, the singularly most restrictive law against facial recognition in the nation right now. And it's, uh, I mean, in one way, as a conservative, I kind of like this because I'm a federalist and I see the states as laboratories. And if my prediction is, is that this hamstrings the main state police and I'm wrong, then we'll yeah, learn. I, but I'm predicting it'll be, they'll be revisiting this in a couple I, of that, years. That's my guess too. They, it's just not smart to say we're going to enforce this law by letting guilty people go free by throwing out good evidence. And that's that strikes me as where they went wrong. If they want to regulate what the police do, there are ways to regulate what the police do without letting guilty people go free. And I do think, I actually, I think there are some restrictions on asking third parties to do searches for you as well. But the serious crime thing is a big problem. If you have video of somebody walking into a store, grabbing $500 worth of stuff and walking out with it, you can't t e take even the best photo and run it against the main DMV database to see if you can figure out who it was. Yeah. Now, I, I should be clear. When I say they're going to ask the FBI, I meant informally. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because you're right. There, I, there is a prohibition on formal, but you know, it's going to be, hey, you know, we can't solve this crime. Can you? <laughs> right, right. And the FBI will say, oh, yeah, it's, it was Stuart Baker. But we're going to decline because it's, it's a, not a big crime. Uh, oh, well, now that we know that it's Stuart, <laughs> we'll reengage. By the way, yep. I'm sorry, Stuart, you'd have to commit two of those crimes to potentially pay off your debt to Paul if the bet goes sideways. Is that right? Yes. And I, he has not said that I could donate uh, $500 worth of clothing and uh, hardware from uh, from Target to, to the ACLU in order to meet this. So I might have to do several more because once you've fenced it, it's nowhere near face value. So Margaret uh, Vestager uh, in the, took on Apple, and I don't know whether to make him anything of this, Matthew. She said, Apple, don't tell us about all the privacy and security reasons for your restrictions if what you're doing is limiting competition. And I think this was probably over the fight 
whether Apple could be forced to open up its app store uh, or allow people to open to offer things on the app store without paying. Apple has said, well, that would be the end of privacy and security. And uh, I think she was basically saying, we all understand you believe in privacy, but it, it doesn't forgive all sin. Right. I think it's a bit like Margaret Vestager saying, I I know you, Apple, know that we love privacy and we talk about it all the time. And so don't wave your privacy in my face when I'm also unhappy that you're on both sides of your platform. And so I think it's kind of interesting because you're watching two well, in Apple's case, a very sophisticated actor sort of waved the privacy flag in what they think is a very privacy-loving forum, the European Union. And the European Union says, yeah, we love it, but we don't love it to the point where, as you say, Stuart, uh, we're going to let you throttle competition. But I, I think it is an interesting dynamic because the EU has been extremely friendly when it comes to pro-privacy arguments. But Vestager has made her bone in the EU, first being the antitrust chief that was going to fix all the, the big titans of tech. And now she's been promoted. And so here she is trying to square the circle. Yep. Well, it's not helping Apple's halo that they just got caught telling their employees that in order to prevent leaks, the employees are going to have to wear cop type body cams, just walking around to doing research, talking to their coworkers, typing away. They're wearing body cams because Apple is determined. Well, what? So in order to make sure that Apple can surprise us at the next announcement of products, that's the goal of this. It's not serving any grand security or even privacy purpose. It's just to preserve the showmanship of an Apple conference. I'm sure every company would do that if they could. Every company. And, would. Yeah. And, and I want to point out also that they've also sued Corelli under what I'll call very, fairly dubious grounds for, you know, claiming a security and privacy issue, which is realistically an anti-competitive bent on their part. Well, it's worse than anti-competitive. It's also a, a bank shot trying to hit the, the FBI and law enforcement. If they can take out Corellium, then that become, it becomes much harder to find holes in Apple's hardware and software. And that's what they're trying to do with this lawsuit against Corellium. They've lost the first battle in that, but the DMCA issue is coming up and that'll be a lot tougher for But it's, I think it's just yeah. good to point out that this is part of their fabric, is their their story is yes. like, we are the gods of privacy, so don't question us on anything. Yeah. So. Yeah. The Chinese... Except uh, for the Chinese is what they meant. There's like a little disagree. footnote yeah. every time. Yeah. Except for the Chinese and probably except for the Russians. And sure. UAE. You know, we we'll just give exceptions to everybody, and... but we're still... Okay. So it's... It, <laughs> except it's a couple of billion people yeah, yeah. in the fine print. So, so, so I just want to go back and, and I want to be clear, Stuart, are you for or against the use of personal body cameras at, at the Apple store? I, I, frankly, I don't care because I will never go there. <laughs> so, all right. Dave, I, let's get geeky. NSA has released the 10th release of their Ghidra open source reverse engineering tool. I thought that was interesting because it's what they did in responding to Tucker Carlson. It's a very public, I mean, it's, it's open source it, it, and it's about reverse engineering, which you can see why NSA would be interested in, but it, it's a remarkably kind of forward leaning thing for somebody who used to be no such Completely, agency. like completely groundbreaking in a way. And Ghidra itself and I don't actually know which way it's pronounced, was released in uh, March of 2019. So this is fairly new for the NSA, not just to be releasing a tool that is polished for reverse engineering, like for the technical community, this was a very big deal. Its main competitor is IDA Pro. There's another smaller one called Binary Ninja. And these tools are sort of part of the community. So the question is the NSA, part of the overall security community or not the way many other security companies would be and i think what nsa has made a strategic choice in is saying yes we are we are not only going to give you this dump the source code on you and dump the tool on you but we're going to be legitimate cooperating with you to continue development so you can submit trouble tickets to their github page there's a discussion there's training there's all this stuff around the tool that allows you to use the tool properly that's sort of above and beyond just sort of 
here's a bunch of stuff. And GCHQ had, has done this with some of their tools, but nothing quite this major. And I just thought it was worth pointing out that this is a strategy that the National Security Agency really pushed into. And I think pushed into strong. I think it might have been Rob Joyce who uh, was behind it, but I can't swear to it. So didn't the NSA also put out SE Linux or something, which was meant to be a secure version of Linux, uh, open source? To, so they've been, and that was 10 years ago. I can't ago remember when the first right? commit was, so they've been but doing yes, so they've well. been cooperating with the Linux kernel community on that for quite some time. And, but I would just say that's a you know very different type of project in many ways, much and much an impact. I don't want to, I don't want to insult my, my friends at the SE Linux team, but like it was not nearly as big a splash as this one. And if you've read the Nicole Polroth book, you know that everyone at the NSA throws darts at my face every day, but I want to give them credit for <laughs> like, this is a, it was a pretty big deal and remains a big deal. Like they've really, they've kept the energy up. So it's the 10th. It's, I don't know if it's the 10th, it's version 10. It has a debugger now doesn't sound like big news to a bunch of lawyers, but it's, it's pretty interesting from a policy standpoint that they're adding major features. It's not a maintenance mode. Okay. Right. okay. And just so I know when they throw those darts, is it because of the kind of spirit that you brought to immunity and that you are also bringing to this new cordyceps? I, I'm trying to figure out what cordyceps does and whether NSA is going to hate it or... We say on our webpage that we do advanced research and engineering, which I kept deliberately vague. There's literally nothing else about it. The cordyceps mushroom is a mushroom that takes over ants and parasites them and, and, and makes them act in a way they otherwise would not, that is not to their best interest. So sort of true to our spirit as offensive information security specialists, I, I don't know if the NSA is going to like it or not, but I think that the trick with the NSA is that some of them will like it and some of them won't. <laughs> that's that almost guaranteed since uh, some of them are in charge of security yeah, and the others are in charge of, uh, of offense. Uh, magic. All right. And uh, let me just close with uh, the last story that I, I think Jordan Schneider asked me to cover, which is police taking, playing Taylor Swift when they're confronting people who want to do videos of the police enforcing the law because they know that if you put it up on YouTube after you've uh, recorded it, if there's Taylor Swift in the background, YouTube's stupid AI algorithms will say, oh, that sounds like a violation of the DMCA. We better take it down. And the, the police have learned that if they turn this on as a general rule, it's not going to show back up on, on YouTube. And of course, everybody's mad at the police. I think you ought to be mad at YouTube, guys. This YouTube's takedown, excessive takedown enthusiasm, and they're building AI tools that take things down on a hair trigger is the source of this problem. And yelling at the police is really the wrong approach, in my view. Well, can't can't we do both, Stuart? <laughs> I mean, that's just not... No, I mean, that's really unreasonable. A police officer deliberately trying to avoid public scrutiny for his act, you wouldn't let him wear a white sheet. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> over his face, right? Or, all right, it, or put uh, tape over his name on his aggressive... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he is a public servant. He's doing wrong. You're right that he's found a loophole and that YouTube's AI is idiotic. You're also, however, I should also mention, of course, that mostly I think this is going to strize and affect all the users. Oh, like yesterday but morning. That's right. It has survived or it has found a way to survive the takedown uh, engine in the usual way of big uh, Silicon Valley, which can always find a way to make exceptions from the most important. I don't even think that's it. I think the reality is the real rule that YouTube has is that you will play the music and you will get your video demonetized, but it will still be available. So they won't. Eh, so he didn't right. even understand what he was really trying to do in the sense of like, oh, well, now everyone's going to be watching it and I'm going to look bad and it's still v available, but no one will make ad money. And there won't and there won't be ads. There won't Even be better. ads running before. Even it. better. Uh, that could be okay. Yep. All right, uh, Paul, David, Matthew, thank you for joining us. Uh, this has been uh, episode three sixty nine of the Cyber Law Podcast. I, I want to before I leave, I want to read the, the re most recent review we got, which I, it's kind of I don't know how I feel about it. Uh, it says mm -hmm. uh, the host has always been so clever and honest. Although it seems lately he's afraid to say his opinion. 
When he says his point now, he always says it like a question as if he's not sure it's okay to say. Wish he would be more like it was before he was worried that Apple Podcasts would not run his show. Ouch. It oh, does. That's, I mean, I don't perceive that, but to the extent that you want to take that on board. <laughs> Yep. It's, I never thought no. I would hear anyone describe Stuart as the chastened Stuart Bain. <laughs> All right. Tim Cook, whatever you're doing, it's working, huh? Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, don't forget to send comments and five-star reviews, for God's sake. You can trash me, but at least give me five stars to cyberlawpodcast at steptoe.com. Thanks also to Weissman Sound Design for our music. This has been episode 369 of the Cyberlaw Podcast, brought to you by Steptoe and Johnson. Mm-hmm.